if you can produce a good piece of work that your readers would want to read, even though it's a branded content, that is typically something that is a win for the advertisers. But sometimes they don't see it that way because they want their marketing message to be in there. So that's the biggest challenge is content strategizing on our end where they might tell us, hey, they want this to be written in a certain way and we say, no, that doesn't work. You try not to tell the advertisers straight in the face, but basically you're telling you're fall flat. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I try to not be so diplomatic or so. Yeah, really? Yeah. Okay, okay, okay. Why I mean, not? I mean, at the end of the day, I mean, just chat, lah, right? Mm, 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 mm. Give some value to people listening. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know that one line just killed a lot of other people. You know, I was trying to say that many other pieces of content that go out there very diplomatic and don't really give value to people tuning in. <laughs> no lah, I'm, I'm sure I'm sure there are people out there who do give value as well. I just mm, uh-huh. mm, maybe mm. they sometimes they scared to say the wrong Share thing. Share me a little bit more. Where's that coming from? Nah, like, I mean, finance space. Uh, everyone always wants to say the right thing, right? Mm, 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 mm. Well, so what does that mean? What does saying the right thing mean? I think in the financial and the media space and maybe even in the influencer space, actually now that I think about it, more with regards to lifestyle influencers, right? They want to present a certain type of narrative, mm, right? Mm. Nothing wrong with that. I think that's just the branding that they're trying to create um, for themselves. But I think for us, it's or like, at least for me, I think we should just be genuine, right? At the end of the day, uh, if we're here to help people, and a lot of people do may, may look up to the, the kind of things we do as well. So I think it's important for us to just be transparent as much as possible. Mm. Uh, the only time I think it's better... So when is it not possible? I think you, you try not to be transparent when certain things are sensitive, right? Certain point of view that people, that we may have, is not something which everyone may agree with. I think that's the, the, the difference in personal finance sometimes that we have to... Like, um, like what? Can you give me an example? Okay, so for yeah. example, even if a simple topic like property, right? Mm. You know, there mm. are a lot of people who say you should stay in a HDB. There are others who believe that don't necessarily need to stay in a HDB. Like for me personally, we, we stay in a private property. Uh, we, we, we bought it last year. I, I wouldn't openly share unless someone asked me, but it's the reason it's more family related. Mm. I don't want to stay near my parents mm. um, because I also have a special needs sister as well uh, mm. who stays with my parents. So if in the event when they're old, uh, they need help, I need to be there as well. Mm, you know, and mm. for HDB, it's quite difficult because basically, you know, you only can own one HDB each. Mm. Right? And then my parents can't own a HDB because um, they also have multiple properties. So these kind of things, you know, uh, stuff that maybe sometimes I don't share. Mm, yeah, just mm. because um, not every, I mean, the, the people might portray it differently sometimes, right? Mm-hmm. Like, hey, you know, this dollars and cents guy says that HDB is the way to go best. Uh, save you money but he himself live in a uh, private property okay, I think, okay, I think okay, this okay, kind okay, of okay, things okay, we okay, have okay. to be yeah, I get it, uh, I get not, it. not that you should be ashamed of any decision you make, mm, but there's mm. a lot of different factors. Some of it is very personal to mm. maybe the family yes, or the circumstances yes, they are yes, in, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. So I think these kind of things sometimes, uh, those are the way I, I try not to share too much because I don't want to be seen as, um, I think the, the, the kind of influence we have, right? Sometimes people look at the things we do mm. and take it as the benchmark of what is- How it should be. How it should be, mm, correct, mm, right? Mm. So for example, I don't share- with people, the kind of stocks I invest in. Mm, so that's mm. quite different from some of the stock investment bloggers out mm, there mm, who mm. like to tell you what they invest in. Mm. I am not a fan of that. Danish also not a fan of that because we don't want to be seen as, hey, this dollars and cents founder, he invests in this kind of company. With shilling, shilling. And you know, we do lose money in some investments. Mm. I mean, obviously a lot of it is long-term anyway. But I think the, the key thing is not so much of like, we embarrassed to say what we invest in. Mm. Uh, or we, But neither are we trying to like, tell everyone, hey, we invest in this company. Mm as well, right? It's mm-hmm. just something we prefer to keep personal because we don't want it to be seen as us potentially uh, promoting a stock, right? I think that's pretty much the norm, actually. If you look at a lot of people in the financial space, Most people in senior positions, they don't they don't share these things on, mm-hmm. right? But yeah. I mean, no, but people, some people will say, oh, if you don't share, then how can I trust your words? That's exactly the key thing, right? Like I think when it comes to the media space and then the blogging space, right? there are a lot of bloggers who are very personal in their approach, right? So they will share with you what they will do. They will share with you the, the things they go for, the experience they have on certain products, right? For us at Dawson Sense, we don't really do that as much. You know, we try to take a more neutral stance on any topic. So when we write about something, the whole idea is to provide a little bit of information in a way that's easily digestible. Probably not the only thing you need to know if you want to invest or mm. consider a platform, mm. but some of the basic information you need to have, right? So we try not to be, and I don't know if that's a good or bad thing, um, 
at the start, sometimes it could be seen as a bad thing. We try not to be too personal with... Why is it a bad thing? Because, to be honest, uh, in the influencer space, uh, this was all the way back in, like I think when we first started out, 2012, 2013, right? Senpai, a lot of, senpai. <laughs> yeah. A lot of the content was being created and probably do better when you take a personal approach towards the topic. And that is actually something we don't really actively do. I would say you guys are not a blog, right? You're more yeah. like a news site, you know. Uh, okay, yeah. that's the funny thing. We're not a news site either, right? Uh, so uh, if you come to Dollars and Cents daily expecting us to recap the recent happening or what's <laughs> happening, you don't see any of those <laughs> things, right? Uh, we're not a news site either. But I think what we do is that a lot of the topics we write are... I, I, the closest example I can think of is more magazine style. So magazines tend to be topical, right? <laughs> yeah, uh, they're yeah. not really news because obviously by the time the issue is out monthly, there's nothing newsy about True. it. But if you pick up a men's health, right? I mean, mm. it's never news. Right? It's just about the topic mm. that they cover, right? So I think that's just... For, for us, is that way. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but that's it. That's it. I want to just share a little bit more, which is that I also tell people that we try to take a neutral stand but it's not right to say we are unbiased. I don't want to like generalize to all journalism and writing and content creators, but it's impossible. It's very hard to not be biased from an individual perspective. All of us have perspective no, on mean, a in, certain in, topic. In, in journalistic school, they will talk about this whole idea of like uh, objectivity, which is like a, a myth of objectivity, you, you right? You can try your best yeah, yeah. to be objective. No, but it, on some level, it's a myth, right? Most people are biased depending on what you consume, what editorial do you publish, so, which so, house correct, do you go under. Correct. So what you know? editorial you publish? So I always yeah. say people, right? The act of being like, for us in the editorial team currently, we are very into properties, mm, right? Mm. So uh, if you look at dollars and cents in general, and, and definitely in the last you know, one year because everyone is interested in properties, you see a lot more emphasis on property related content. Mm. Okay, firstly, because people are in Singapore are definitely interested to read more property content, but also because the editorial team collectively, we are interested in the topic. Mm. So it's, it's very natural that we write more about it, mm. right? But I think the kind of content we produce isn't a situation where, okay, so I, I think some of the individual bloggers may have a challenge where, you know, if they are younger and they haven't really bought their own house, it might be harder for them to write about property or why you should buy a HDB flat because you know maybe they haven't bought a HDB flat. But I think as a collective team and the fact that a lot of our content that we write isn't exactly about our say property purchasing experience, uh, that allows us to take a more you know neutral stand on this topic. So you would see a topic like maybe step-by-step -step guide to understanding BTO grants in Singapore, mm, right? Mm. So we don't need to have taken those grants to write a topic like that. Mm. There is pros and cons from a content creation point of view. Okay, I'll start with the cons first. The cons mm. is that I think in general, personal experience type of content can fly better more easily. So if I share with you my terrible experience on renovating my HDB flat, I think it got a very good chance of going viral. Clickbait, yes. Right? Mm. I, I won't say clickbait. Lah. You know, mm. Clickbait is like when, you know, they promise you this, but then when you click the article, there's nothing. Oh, okay, right? okay. But at least it baits you in. Uh, you come in. You uh, come good in. angling. Yeah, 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 I think, yeah, I think yeah. the kind of topics that could be a bit easy to go viral. Mm. Lah, you know, everyone can relate to a terrible renovation mm. experience. Mm. Uh, but for us, we don't really do that kind of content. So that's just something we don't do as often. Mm. Um, the good thing is that, especially when you have a collective team of writers, which is what we focus on, you can write more topics. Mm. Not everything has to be from a personal experience. You can do the research you need. You can go and find the information you need. And then you can write it in a way that's easily relatable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So how do you then manage a situation where you may not agree with the editorial? Um, okay, so like from your own personal view, you don't agree, but the house view is this is what it is. Okay, so a couple of things to note, like we don't exactly give a lot of opinions on topics. There are opinion pieces, don't get me wrong, but in general, we don't give a lot of views on, for example, okay, we might write an article about buying a private versus public housing, but then it could be like a pros and cons kind of things. Which on some level has a view to it, right? Which on some level yeah. has a view to it. So mm. definitely whoever writes it would likely two things, right, have to be somewhat knowledgeable on the topic. Mm. Uh, and then they may have some personal experience, mm. Mm. right? So I think uh, that is the part that I say is very hard to say you're completely unbiased. Yeah, yeah. Because you have your own worldview, you have your own basis Correct. of experience, Correct. and that taints all the things yeah. that you say. So and if you put a byline on an article, you need to be able to justify whatever you write. Obviously, as an editor, I think, or as, as an editorial team, we set certain guiding principles, right? So for example, uh, we'll never recommend stocks, for example, because we can't, right? So those are guiding principles that guide it. Uh, we'll never deep dive into specific cryptocurrencies, mm. right? Uh, that, that is 
can call it a house view or the editorial mm-hmm, view, mm-hmm. right? But on individual writing level, uh, obviously the writers is responsible for whatever they write. Information should be backed up with facts. It cannot just be an opinion. If you say that HGV prices in Singapore are very expensive, mm. you can, you're entitled to that point of view, but I need to see some form of in comparison to maybe other countries. You know, if you, maybe you bring up some stats that shows medium income versus average HDB price compared to other first world nation. And if it looks, oh yeah, Singapore does look a lot more expensive than other similar developed cities, then yes, that's okay to say. But you cannot just say it because you feel that yeah, is your yeah, thought yeah, process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And I would even argue to say that if you can take out median income relative to property prices, right, you're already quite sophisticated. Already. Uh, you, you, because, should, <laughs> la, you should. I mean, if you have a strong view, you yes, should have yes, it, yes, right? Yes, it yes. can't just be a... Mm-hmm. I mean, look, if you want to write an article you, and you have strong views about that, you have to back up your point of view, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you know, don't exert that viewpoint. La. Yeah, yeah. Fair, fair, but, fair. but it's tiring. I'll say that from a content creation point of view, from an editorial point of view, it's quite tiring because that means every article you are implementing that type of thinking. Mm, yeah. I get it, I get it. But from the time you started writing all the way to now, it's been like what, 10, 10, years. Years. Yeah, 10 years. Landscape has changed. Landscape right? has changed, like yeah. Maybe when I first started, there's not a lot of content you know, yeah. a few people kind of dominate the online space Correct. but today it's like all sorts of mediums yeah. everyone you know everything right so uh, how has that changed in terms of like the experience for the consumer yeah you're, you're right Reggie so mm-hmm. like in the past when we first started 2012 and we were not even doing it full time that was just a passion project yeah. the first three years Sounds right like most of the blogs at that period of time. it is, yes, it is yes. right it was starting from a place where there's very little financial content mm-hmm. that maybe unless you're talking about mainstream media mm-hmm. or overseas website which like invest Wikipedia, Business Insider back then, which have good content, but maybe not localized yeah. to Singaporeans, right? So back then, that was the challenge. And uh, that's when we started as well. And we try to take a very consumer-friendly approach because even if you look at sites like uh, or media like BT or Wall Street Journal, it's very targeted towards people in the financial space or business leaders, not really the average person in Singapore that has to make a financial decision still. So that's how we started Laws and Sense. And back then, in general, you're right, right? There's a lot less sites. The blogs, there are financial bloggers, but they tend to be smaller, less mainstream, uh, definitely very little or no advertising dollars at that point in time, <laughs> even, right? So don't, don't even talk about trying to get Make a sponsored a post. Yes, yes, yes. You know, yes, what yes. Why sponsored posts don't yeah, understand, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, at that point mm-hmm. in time, right? Uh, today, the problem is that there's too much information. In the past, it used to be financial blocks or media companies that mm. will create content. Mm. Nowadays, every single House, financial yes. institution want to create their own content. Yes. To me, the idea being that there is a value to the SEO when people search on a certain topic, they mm. land on your website. And then from there, you obviously can surface your products or your services. Mm. So every site wants to do that. Nothing wrong. It's a content marketing play, right? So yeah, yeah. then the question becomes so many websites, who do I read? Yeah. Right. So we, the consumer goes from a point of view 10 years ago where not enough sites creating content to now there's too many who do I read so that's the the challenge right that that I think a lot of consumer and I think what we typically do is we just go to the trusted platforms like, mm. or generally the ones we feel we can trust better like. and then of course you cross reference right you don't just read one review you cross reference but I, I would say that the more trusted platforms still have an itch in the finance space when I look at content sites or rather new sites right if I want to get uh, a little bit more insights. I go to places like Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, mm. right? Not that they are totally unbiased, but sometimes have very strong views that you disagree with also. You mean like against China? <laughs> US, US, US media, US general, media. Yeah. So right. I don't trust them on, on, on I, I that I mean, ground. I wouldn't yeah. say I don't trust them, but at the end of the day, they are US media sites. Yeah, la, bias right? on that ground. So totally. let's just leave yeah, it as yeah, that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah US yeah, media yeah. sites. Uh, I think as savvy readers, we should always be aware of these things. Yeah, they are yeah. US media sites. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> I'm not saying yes, they are biased. Yes. So I read them no, I think as well. when I read Al Jazeera, when they are not talking about the Middle East. All right, that's a logical way okay, to think so about I this. Okay, so I read France 24. Because they, they have no they, reason they have to, no be, incentive to because, be biased, Because right. they have the whole issue with Qatar and Saudi yeah. and all that, right? So, but they have a decent coverage on like other other parts of the world, mm. right? So generally, like if you read RT, which is a Russian news site, right? Then you will question their views on like 
the US, right? So similar when you read all the US financial news site, then you got to question their worldview on how they look at I China and other parts of the world. topics, they may have no reason to be biased or so, uh, uh, right? Uh, so uh, maybe politics, you might feel that that sensing. But I think if you ask me about like, the financial markets and things like that, mm. typically they have no strong incentives to be biased in, mm, mm, you know, besides mm, mm, maybe mm, the fact that, you know, the information is just there and that's how they interpret it. Mm, right? mm, but if you talk about political news, you know, mm, mm, uh, yeah, maybe maybe there is some mm, incentives mm. there. So as a person born into an age where there's all these information yeah. out there, everybody is putting out narratives, trying to drive certain ideas, specifically in the financial world, you know, and then sometimes it gets very heated, right? I mean, you see the forums are oh, very heated, right? So uh, how do I then come in as an individual to then discern all this information and say, which one should I listen to? So, so that's a sensitive question, right? If you have a bank or a robo-advisor, mm-hmm. right? And then they write a content about certain things, mm-hmm. right? The logical plugging that they will have is that they will want to say, okay, you know, this is the problem you have with investing. Here's how my platform can help you, right? As a consumer, I mean, if you are somewhat savvy, you will just know that that's mm. just how they are doing it, lah, right? Mm. It's content mm. marketing for them. Nothing wrong. They're just doing the marketing work that they should be doing. Mm. But would you truly say that they are independent? I think even they themselves will say they're not independent, mm. right? There's no debate there. Uh, does it mean the information is bad? No. I think it can still be very valuable. But you want to take it with a pinch of salt, lah, knowing that the implicit biasness that they likely would have. Mm. Mm. Using robo-advisors as an example, right? It's going to be very likely that more or less they would always talk about having that diversified portfolio and making sure you invest long term. That's, that's their main offering. La. And that's mm. logical as well, right? So mm. if you want to hear their insights on that, they might even be an expert on, on those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. They've right? come on our show a few times. Correct. So, yeah. uh, but then if you talk about, would, would they ever say that you should invest in individual stocks, trade the markets? Mm. Probably not. And and rightly so, because they probably wouldn't want to get into a conversation that's nothing to do with them. Mm. Yeah, I, yeah, I think yeah, yeah, where yeah. the line maybe you drawn a little bit is when one party trashes the other way of investing mm, just mm. because that's not really that's what, not their offer. That's what not what they, they offer. offer. Yeah, yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Because I think in general, not 100%, but most financial instruments, I call it somewhat neutral. So even you look at something like options, some people will say option trading is very risky. You should steer away from it, right? But actually, the early days when, when options or call or put options or future contracts are being developed, it's actually meant to de-risk Yes, the, the yes. farmer, the farmer who's growing his mm. his rice or corn, right? Mm. Is so that he has that price certainty mm. uh, next year when his crops are harvested, that mm. he knows what the market will pay him yeah. versus at that point in time oversupply. Yeah, then yeah, he yeah, 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 yeah so yeah. so even products that are like derivative products or like option products, they are neutral. It's how we use it that makes it speculative. Mm, mm, yeah, mm, that's mm, what mm. I would say. What, what about ILPs? ILPs? Because it's like super heated, right? Yes. Yeah, it's very hot online, all the forums, yeah. you know, both sides fight each other. That, that, okay, so yeah. I, I, I have written an article uh, mm. just slamming ILPs mm. years ago, right? And back then, the product construct to me was not efficient for someone who is potentially trying to invest and grow his money, mm-hmm. right? But there's so many flip side of the coin, right? So to me, if you want to invest and grow your money, there are better solutions out there that you can consider, even at that point in time. Now, of course, there's even, even more, more yeah. right? Someone else can say, hey, you should look at it maybe from an insurance coverage point of view. Mm. The truth is that ILP itself, there is so many different versions yes, of it, right? Yes. In general, the product can be quite complex. Mm. I think it's fair to say, and I think even financial advisors will agree with me, it's very hard for a consumer to choose or discern it on their own without someone advising them because That's of the a very te- complex model because of the technicality yes, of the product, yes, right? Yes. Again, not a generalized thing. Some products might be a bit more simple, but in essence, I think when you buy an ILP, you definitely need the advice of a financial advisor. Mm. Even just, for example, from an investment point of view, where to put your money. And I think the products and, and rightly so, the insurance themselves have also evolved their products over time, yes. right? So in today's context of the ILP product, I would say that I, I'm not super familiar with how it's being offered, but there's a a lot of technical details that's being put in such that you probably need an advisor to yes, yes. do it. That's it. I don't get an ILP. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, so for yeah. me, as an individual level, I use insurance for protection for mm. myself, my family, and then I invest separately. I try to keep it separate. Mm, yeah. I, I, I get what you're saying because actually with insurance investments paired together, man, actually the modeling is very complicated. The, the amount of things that you got to model think, in, into the clarity yeah, is, I, I is think quite it, hard. I think you can even simplify it a bit further, right? Which is that if... My insurance coverage is vital to me. 
I want to be able to hold on to my insurance coverage regardless of How the what my investment yeah. portfolio is doing. Mm. So I don't want a situation where I decided not to invest, hence I lose my insurance coverage as well, mm. Mm. right? So mm. vice versa, right? You know, if I want to invest, I, I can invest independently. Mm. My insurance coverage is a separate problem that I should take care of yeah. separately. Yeah. So that's how I see it. And maybe that's not exactly great for like financial advisor, especially if they are trying to push these products mm. when people like us say these things. But I also have a, have a little bit of a afterthought after so many years, right? Which is that, so one of the things that we were very strong at when we first started or very passionate in was about the financial advisory space and how there's maybe a lot of conflict of interest, some form of mis-selling. I started having the idea of dollars and cents actually during the global financial crisis. Mm. So I was in army back, back then, 20, mm -hmm. 2009. And then a lot of GFC stuff, you know, all the mini bonds, Lehman crisis. I was just reading up and then how retirees lose their money mm. uh, to products that they thought were, were safe. Safe products, 4-5% return, not out of the blue, should be quite safe. Securitization, then they realized that, you know, they, they lost money. So that got my interest. And then when you start to deep dive, you realize, hey, there's so much conflict of interest with a lot of like commission based, not just the insurance companies, right? The, the banks as well, mm. right? The bankers, they are remunerated on a commission base. They try to push sales. And that got my interest in, in finance. In the early days, we were very passionate about speaking out against this kind of conflict of interest thing. And then after a while, we realized that Sometimes when you are too passionate about something, it's counterintuitive. Why? Because at the end of the day, insurance is still important. But what if you have a very strong media trying to make all insurance people seem like, oh, they are just out there to con your money, get you to pay for things you don't need, mm -hmm. right? Then what you have is that opposite effect where your readers, they are reading your sites and trust your content. They start to have you to, to be super skeptical about insurance to the point that maybe it's counterproductive for them, mm. right? You know, you have a kid, you should buy insurance, but you think, no, 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 insurance waste money, one, mm. right? So then I realized that, hey, we have to be more balanced in our views, mm. right? Otherwise, the people, the readers we try to help, it may, may actually work against them if we put a very strong opinion against something that they might have needed. Mm. Yeah. What, what about sponsored posts, right? Because when, when, when advertisers yeah. come to us, say they want to do something, they put money. They want their they results. They want right? their results yeah. and they want things to be said a certain way. So how then as a consumer of content, you know, like uh, how do you how do you kind of I think there is a few things, things to I think I can say from a publisher point of mm. view, right? It's, it's sponsored post is one of those topics that I mean at the end of the day, we look at the the media space. Most media companies, they make money two ways, right? Either the subscriber pay or the advertisers pay. And actually for most media companies, including your mainstream medias, is both. Right. Mix, yes. you, you pay for a subscription and you still see ads as well. I think from a consumer point of view, we just have to understand how the media business work. Lah, that mm. advertising is what drives most. In fact, it's <laughs> typically not the subscription fee. Yeah, yeah, Even yeah. for media publishers that charge you for a premium paywall or stuff, subscription fee is likely just a small percentage of their overall revenue. Mm. It's the advertising Unless dollars. Unless you're New York Times. La. No, la, uh, even what's no, I mean, the, what's if the you revenue look at New York Times uh, financial, I think it's about 50-50 at this point. Oh, it's 50-50. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they are the most successful subscriber yeah, based the most of, uh, model. Yeah. And I mean, the, the Times is one of those where, you know, people wouldn't mind paying for, I think. But I think for most of us media sites, yeah, yeah, it yeah. is quite hard to expect. Very hard, very hard. Yeah, and yes. even, I mean, look at the Times, right? I think it's, they are cheating like 10 mil type of numbers, which is great for them. But I mean, comparatively to the world, it's, mm -hmm. it's really just a yeah. small percentage still, right? So that really tells you the number of people who are willing to pay for content, right? Mm -hmm. and, and for the rest of us who don't have a paywall or don't intend to put a paywall, it's advertising dollars, lah, right? Yeah. It goes without saying, right? Yeah. So then the question comes from a publisher point of yeah. view, right? How can I trust you when you're how sponsored can, posts? Can, a few things, right? So I think the, the first thing is that as a publisher, you have to take on sponsors that make sense for you, mm. right? Right. If you are stock investing heavy website, then suddenly you have a robo advisor come to you. It's not within your company's, uh, your bar ethos. publisher's ethos to actually, mm. it's different. It's a differing view already, right? Mm. And those are the ones that I think money aside, you know, I think publishers or bloggers should think twice, lah, right? Mm. About taking it. That's the first thing. The second thing is, it is very time consuming, not easy to manage advertisers' expectations especially when you try to infuse editorial or advertorial, if it's an advertorial, right? So they will want you to write in a certain way, yeah. right? But <laughs> do note, lah, they also want the performance to be good. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. So readers are not stupid at all, right? 
if it's a sponsored post, and, and I mean, you should declare it, we declare it, most publishers declare it, mm. people will know it's a sponsored post. And then if the content is just whatever the advertisers want to say, then, you know, chances are it's not going to fly well, lah, right? Which goes without saying, right? And advertisers may want all their messaging to be in there, but they also want the performance to be good. So how do you balance the two? The fact is that if you can think of it as it is consistent, it goes in the same direction, right? If you can produce a good piece of work that your readers would want to read, even though it's a branded content, that is typically something that is a win for the advertisers. Mm. But sometimes they don't see it that way because they want their marketing message to be in there. So that's the biggest challenge. It's, it's to be honest, quite time consuming. It requires a lot of content strategizing on our end where they might tell us, hey, they want this to be written in a certain way and we say, no, that doesn't work. You try not to tell the advertisers straight in the face, but basically you want to tell them you'll fall flat. <laughs> right? <laughs> And then when it falls flat, I, I vibing here, I vibing. And then when it falls flat, you will come back to me. And then they come and me, tell you, it's like, yeah, hey, why you're not, not effective? You're not effective. Yeah. It's like, bro, you force feed me some of these messages. So it's it's tiring. You mm. do need, you know, people to manage the advertisers. A lot of times after you work with them a while, they trust you. Yes, enough. yes, yes. So that's yes, the best yes, type of yes, advertisers. Best, best. They trust you to produce content in a way that will be relatable mm. to your readers, that will be valuable to your readers. And also valuable to them. can weave yeah. in their messaging, mm. right? So I have quite a few clients like that over the years. Mm. Uh, it, it's great to work with them. The results typically show we just get a lot of benefits because actually uh, my co-founder Dinesh once said this, right? Are you better off reading a clickbaitish article that is written hazardly or a well-researched, properly curated, sponsored post that, you know, we have to clear compliance, we have to make sure all the facts are correct and we also want to make sure that you benefit from reading, mm -hmm. right? And, and typically for sponsored articles, as I think you, I mean, all of us know, like, it takes a lot more time, a lot a more lot, research lot. to produce that piece versus an organic article that if you want to return and publish the next day. You can wing it. Yeah. Up. So uh, often the, the sponsored content can actually be more valuable than the organic because there's so much more effort that needs to be put in. If it's aligned to what the website typically will write about, then it's okay. I think the problem comes when bloggers, not necessarily financial bloggers, you see a lot of lifestyle sites or so on. They take on financial <laughs> products. Lai tiang, lai tiang. <laughs> no names available. <laughs> because the truth is that the money is there, right? The, yes, the, yes, the yes, FIs yes. got the, the banks, the insurance companies, the fintech firms, they have the most amount of advertising dollars to mm. spend, right? CPM so, is high. So once they max out the financial sites, you know, they want new target audience, they go to the lifestyle sites. Mm. And that's where it looks awkward sometimes, right? Mm. When you have a social new site that suddenly starts producing financial content, then it's obviously a sponsored post, la, everyone yeah, know, yeah, right? Yeah. They read off script one. La. If in a lot of the setups, they may not have someone who is very financially knowledgeable anyway, right? Mm, so what mm, are they going to mm. say if there is a CFD platform provider that mm. wants to advertise eh, for CFD platform I mean, well, very casually. Casually. I mean just, yeah, 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 just yeah, a technical yeah, yeah, yeah. thing right what, what's mm, the writer mm, going mm, to really mm, say mm, right so it ends up with features law fees law rewards or pretty uh, much I, always ends yeah. up with those few things I mean it, I wouldn't say like we don't take other kind of content as well so like for example I, I, I was just thinking about some of the non-finance clients we take in right so uh, two comes to mind from a long time ago both food related right so one was with Tiger Beer Mm. this was many years ago uh, so Tiger Beer had this I, I love this campaign right so for Tiger Beer I, I really like the it, it still sticks to me right the advertising campaign was about street food so they wanted to basically showcase the street food culture in Singapore and then obviously you can drink your Tiger Beer with the street food yeah, yeah, which yeah, is yeah, what yeah. happens in the coffee shop right so they, they approached us when, we, when they approached us we were like oh wow you know, we, we never take a F&B brand before right so but then in the end we tried to put a bit of a financial angle which did very well so the article I still remember, remember writing was like cost of running a hawker in Singapore so we found our own hawker profile. We interviewed him. Everything was organic because the information we get was clearly just from the bus, the people we interview, and then roughly how much it took him to start his hawker store without going into details lah, because mm. we don't want to be too specific. And it's just part of the campaign lah. And the article did really well, right? So sometimes if you put a little bit more creativity, you ask yourself where does dollars and cents stand in, or where does your financial side sense sense in on this conversation, then you can think, yeah, cost of running a hawker I think it's a topic that Singaporeans are generally interested to know mm -hmm. you know my uh, database tell me yes people yeah. care about it so and then there's a money angle as well mm -hmm. right so mm -hmm. you know when it sits on our website it's not completely weird you know we're not trying to review the but or anything mm -hmm. like that mm -hmm. right we're just doing what makes sense for us and I think that's what sometimes get overlooked when it comes to content creation I think mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. just trying to put an, an angle to these kind of topics mm -hmm. fair 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 but then when the sponsors come in right and they they try to weave certain angles into your stuff yeah right? and they try to put out certain messaging I get you you're talking about the process mm -hmm. it's very difficult I get the air clear and see it's very tautian it's one of the worst mm -hmm. shit ever okay but oh, sorry LNC 
<laughs> not so I tell you. But yeah, it, it, they're doing their job, you know, but it's it's a, it's a lot of problems. Yeah. But from a consumer standpoint, right? Like, how do they then know that this is uh, like hol- holistic in the view of this is how I should look at a piece of content? Okay, in general, um, when it's a financial product, we want to make sure that it's MS regulated. Mm. So the company should be MAS regulated. And if there isn't, there must be a specific reason why. Maybe they're just not a financial client in the first place, right? Mm. So MAS do have very strict regulations on who is regulated, right? Um, so that's the first check that I think all of us should do, you know, when we talk about financial advertiser. I think secondly, um, it's important to understand the product so that you know how to explain it in a way that people can understand the pros and the cons. So whoever the editorial, the writer is, needs to understand these products well so that they can highlight disadvantages of the product if need be, right? I personally feel like based on our experience, most of the clients get that actually. Because if you're MS regulated and you're in the finance space, right, compliance is going to be quite strict as well. Serious, right? yes. Compliance so is serious. even if you want to say all the good things about it, they may not be able to allow you to say anyway. Mm-hmm. Right? So most clients that are MS regulated, they, they do get it. And I think that is something which helps. That said, we do reject clients. We do take down posts or drafts after they have been sent because of differences that we can't agree with the client sometimes. But usually we try to keep that as little as possible, especially once work has started. So a lot of the due diligence on our end have, will start before mm. we even sometimes reply the first email, mm-hmm. right? And I think we are quite fortunate because we've been around for a long time. So most of our clients are generally bigger and more established FIs, like financial institutions. So they themselves have their credibility to protect as well. Mm. Yeah. So I think that is something that helps us. I do sometimes see smaller financial blocks. Uh, Maybe they are more receptive to smaller advertisers, less established companies. So that one is a little bit riskier, need to do more due diligence. Mm. And and we do. Sometimes we see companies, hey, where's these companies from? Do a lot of fact finding before we even reply them. You know, sometimes... You know, you try not to reply them, you know. Right? You know, if, I know, I know, I know. Uh, you, you guys probably get it a lot as well. <laughs> I get right? it, I get, so, I get a lot this uh, But knowing what your site should be doing and what it shouldn't be doing is is something that's very, very important. Um, it's actually even harder for us, right? Because we don't just do it full time with a team of writers and the setup is full time, right? So to to look at advertising dollars, it, it's bread and butter, right? Otherwise you can't do it obviously right but we we have a strong process for that lah mm. yeah it's not it's not that easy it's not that easy Hey, welcome to the Financial Coconut Podcast Network. I'm your host, Reggie, aka Your Chief Financial Coconut. And if you are loving what we are creating here, like, share, subscribe, share with your loved ones, comment in the comment section below. And yeah, we'll see you for great content on Chill Swift TFC. Okay, okay. So what what is uh something that you put out that didn't age so well? I would say some of the early days insurance articles that I wrote could have been a little bit too harsh on the industry, mm. I would say. I wouldn't regret anything I write, but I, I think that, you know, in general, it was a little bit, we could have been more balanced in our view, not just heat up against the insurance mm. industry in the early days and instead put in more effort towards educating people about insurance. So how has it right? evolved? So, so if, you think, your if you think about evolved? it, you, you don't like a topic, right? Mm. They say insurance. You don't like how it's happening. You can either spend your effort and your energy complaining, writing, you know, um, suggesting what's wrong with all this way of doing the advisory or you can put in your effort towards explaining what consumers should think about when they approach a financial advisor, mm. right? Which is actually more close, which is actually closer to what we ourselves would do also. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? I you would likely mm. talk to a financial advisor. What mm. you actually need as a consumer is to be savvy enough such that if you happen to meet an advisor or the advisor tries to sell you something that you don't really need, you ask the right questions and then make sure you don't get products you don't need or even just stay away from the guy mm-hmm. if you think that you know he doesn't have your best interest at heart. Right. So mm-hmm. I think that is, you know, you're saying what does didn't age so well. I think the early days being super harsh on the insurance industries may maybe did no one any favor. You know, and what we could have done, what we are doing now is more more sort of educating people about the importance of insurance and what they should think about. Mm. And um, maybe it comes with age as well, right? So mm. like now, you know, I'm married with, with three kids. You know, insurance protection is something that's very, very vital, right? Because anything happens to me or my wife, you know, the, the kids, someone needs to 
care for them and, and it's not just physical, it's financial as well, right? So you start thinking about all these things and then you realize that, hey, you know, I'm probably a good ambassador for the insurance industry now because I'm one of those guys who call my insurance agent before my kid comes out saying, mm-hmm. bro, we need to get some advice, plan some uh, critical illness as soon as possible. Please help me advise what are the products we can get and then let's fill in the paperwork, right? Mm-hmm. That's why I advocate, right? Parents should, should talk to their advisors as soon as as their kid is coming out. Because, because before the kid comes out, then uh, it's essentially there's a whole period where you, there's there's no data to evaluate your, your kid uniquely. So then the risk profile is neutral. Yeah, no, actually... Uh, and it's, then it's, that is actually the... Your, it's you not get just the, a bad time. Okay, so actually a lot of insurers, uh, most of the products like the shield plan, typically there's a waiting period of about 30 days, mm. right? So if there is a problem during the first few weeks, uh, you don't get covered. Lah. It's only after 30 days then they will accept. Mm. I, I think it's around 30 days or so. Uh, but the plan, the idea is that you want to get it as soon as possible, right? Because even after 30 days, you know, I mean, it's, kids can go into the hospital quite easily. Right? Mm. If they accidentally get a virus, the doctor mm. not sure why, two months old, straight away hospitalized really, mm. right? Because everybody wants to play safe in Singapore. Mm. So it's kind of things that cost you money. So you should get it as soon as possible. Mm. And the worst thing is that if, if that do happen and you haven't got the insurance and even after your kid comes out, you know, the insurance is going to ask you questions yeah yeah so, so exactly the whole when you have so as no soon as basis possible, and, yeah, 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 yeah on a neutral ground you actually get in some ways the best value but once yeah. data comes in uh, the differential of your kid Correct. you know all that things then it all gets factored into yeah. the premium and i mean the these are the kind of education that mm. you know we try to do these days mm. you know mm. like i say you know we try to move away from just saying what's wrong with the industry, try to focus on how you can help people as well, mm-hmm. right? So this kind of education piece, which is like, hey guys, you know, you want to throw a first month birthday for your kid, don't forget to get an insurance policy at the same time. You know, these are good messaging uh, uh, that uh, uh, helps people. And then, you know, sometimes they ask you, what, what do you buy? It's like a simple shoe plan for a start, uh, you know, uh, will, will at least cover any hospital bills that comes in, yeah, yeah, in the yeah. off chance that, you know, sick and they have to be hospitalized. Mm-hmm. Because I, I have that experience as well. My first kid was, I think it was like four months or so. So uh, typical, uh, you know, fought for ill, then there was an incident, then quickly sent her to hospital. Doctor didn't know why. Hospitalized for, like, I think, two or three days. Why well, it's like 1,005, you know, just like that. Mm. Public hospital. Luckily, you already bought the insurance so that at least it's it's covered. You don't have to pay anything. Mm-hmm. Fair, fair, fair point. What and, do you think? Like, yeah. uh, no, I'm, I'm, I, ca- I come from a view that... Um, challenge the status quo or we no, focus I, on I, educating? I, I come from a view that you cannot blame the seller because they are inherently incentivized to sell, right? But yeah. you need to focus on educating the buyer, right? Yes. So that's, yeah. that's my world view. As much as possible, I always try to break down the concepts, their selling process. Why are certain things done like this? Why they can throw money out there because your LTV is much higher than their CAC you know uh, a lot of these kind of things like how do you how is the product created what are the layers within it so I mean on my show or at least on my personal segment it's it's mostly all of these kind of stuff right because I don't think you can blame the seller for selling because they are inherently incentivized to sell I think the product it's on its own it's neither good or bad if you if you get what I mean right no no financial institution comes out with a product but uh, everybody wants to sell the yeah, product. Yeah, the, so the selling your is... product chui, right? It's also very hard to sell. But in the financial world, I think at this point in time, we all realize that a lot of the products are intentionally make it a little bit difficult to compare relative, right? So if let's say there are like six factors that you compare across the board for a particular policy or for a particular tool, then everybody kind of matches other and then you're not here a little bit higher, then a little bit lower. You know, so, so it makes yeah. it, they try to stand, they, they engineer products to try to stand out and be a little bit different from other other people and it's very hard to compare apples for apples on those grounds i think i think i have a thought process here and and it's quite linked to fintech as well Mm. which is that if your product is thriving because consumers are poorly informed then you have a problem Mm. because that in other words that means you are profiting because people are unaware Mm. but if your product is a product that will do even better as consumers become more financially savvy more educated then chances are you have a good product Mm. because that means that as people become more knowledgeable they want your product. And truth is, those guys don't advertise. Most of the people that create those kind of products, they don't advertise one. So you feel- I've met many of them. There's always more where I advertise. Money just flows, right? And and I, I mean, I don't, I will not name yeah. the products here, but the reality is because they are best in class, you know, as a, whether is it a broker, whether is it a fund, whether is it a trust, they don't need to advertise. I don't completely agree. For, for people that know- No, but I, I, don't, know? I don't completely agree, you know, because mm. I think there are many good products out there that 
that just people just don't know because it's not there's not enough information, not enough marketing or advertising around it. Yeah, I, I yeah, agree with well. that as a point, you know, but <laughs> from my view of the situation, a lot of these products, they are very good. They are not throwing money at advertisers. Like I'm not receiving their calls and I ask around, say, hey, no, they don't really sponsor a lot. So I'm like, oh, okay, okay. Because they don't need to. They Business don't need too to. They're best in class, yeah. right? I, so, I, think, I think what we can agree on is that, uh, you know, if a financial institution has a product that as more people are financially more savvy, they start to use it less, then that company has a problem. Yeah, la, yeah, right? yeah. That means you are, I, I can say, benefiting because your customers are not aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right? But, but that's not to say everybody that advertises is lousy yeah, yeah, yeah. product. Yeah, yeah. But, but it's, it's really... So, so for companies that are confident that as long as the readers or the consumers are more educated, they will want their product, mm. I think those guys are the ones that we will want to work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? yeah, yeah, yeah we yeah. want to work with the guys who are trying to keep things hush-hush not transparent because they are afraid that once they are transparent, people will not even want their product anymore. Mm-hmm. I think those are the, maybe sometimes there's legacy issues or so mm-hmm. with some of the things. Uh, I, I mean, I'm just going to say it out like brokerage platforms, right? Uh-huh. You have $25 transaction fee, you have one dollar transaction fees. Savvy you got consumers. No dollar transaction fee. <laughs> no, and no those dollars. guys don't advertise. You don't most, need me to mostly say Mostly I think the, yeah. The more savvy, I mean, if you want to invest $500 a month DCA, you know, mm. how can you pay $25 as a transaction mm. fee, right? That's 5% of your sing, capital. Sing, sing, ba. Sing, sing, ba. <laughs> so, no, because sometimes when they come as advertisers, I'll be like, can you improve your product first? It's, it's very hard tough. for me to spin. Yeah, I mean, it's tough, right? Yeah. And sometimes there are more to meet the eye. Sometimes the product in its own, there are also certain factors that people of don't course, know. Of course, of course. But, you know, you look at a consumer, if he just wants to invest $100, $200 a month DCA, then how is he going to yeah, pay $25 yeah, commission yeah, fee, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so I think those are the challenging questions. That, yeah, but in, in finance, naturally, when there's a need for the product, uh, there will be someone that comes yeah. in to create a product and kind of fill it up, right? Yeah. So, so I think there's the kind of market dynamics that exist, but the bigger issue is always when certain messaging are being force fed. And, yeah. and the certain things are sold in a certain way. But after that, the consumer will be like, hey, actually, like that matching my original plan. You, you know, know, part of my my job on a somewhat regular basis is um getting a lot of brief, usually from, I don't say client, like, they don't like the agencies, client, yeah, agencies, yeah, agencies, yeah. agencies, right? Mm-hmm. And then the agency person uh, who always sometimes feels like, you know, this is maybe the first or second financial brand they ever handled. <laughs> For their agency. Okay, okay, I vibing here. Yeah, I vibing here. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, right? And yeah. I feel like I'm educating them yeah, yeah. more than they. they because they, because <laughs> you look at a typical marketing agency, a smaller ones, right? They are likely they that don't know one, they don't have many financial yeah, clients, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. probably a lot of smaller lifestyle brand, one or two financial mm. clients, which is very very important for yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. They give you a brief and then they try to tell you about, hey, this is the USP of maybe this platform. So like, bro, or, this is not USP. This cap- Everybody yeah. use the same shit. Yeah, and like- then. <laughs> Correct. Your agency one thing, right? Marketing. Let's talk about sponsored content. Yeah, you want yeah, to pay yeah, you yeah, money, yeah, right? Yeah, and then yeah. they tell you this is the brief, or this is the USP, mm-hmm. right? And then you look at it and like, oh my goodness, this is not really a USP, right? If we write about it, a savvy consumer is just going to say that it's like, bro, there's nothing, there's nothing yeah, in yeah, there. You know, I can get here. something yes. cheaper actually elsewhere, yes, right? Yes, yes. And then sometimes like, when you say like, maybe a product design is the wrong thing, mm. sometimes also it's because the agency themselves pick up, no the, clue. Or, yeah, or they yeah. pick up the wrong USP, yeah, yeah. right? And sometimes when you talk to the client directly, and you tell them this is the sentiments of people. You know, if you want to target, if you want to focus on this USB, you may even get backlash. Yes. Right. Yes. Which is something that nobody wants. Yes. As yes. a publisher, you don't want the backlash. As a brand, you don't want the backlash. Mm-hmm. So for, for us, it's typically we just tell them, hey, I'm just telling you, we don't want to get into trouble. You don't want to get into trouble. This is not a USB. You have to focus on something that's actually different. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. And there are clients that will listen to you, which yeah. is great, right? And then, of course, there are clients that don't want to listen to you. Yeah. Uh, and usually, those just don't pan out well. Yeah, they don't yeah. pan out well. Yeah. Actually, actually, some of the most exciting projects are the ones where you know the products are best in class. Yeah. And then they're still willing to throw marketing dollars. Right? Well, that is very easy to push, you but, know, but in, in, my there, view, in my is view. Is that really hard? I mean, I, I just want to weigh in here, right? It's very, really, very difficult for anyone to specifically be clearly the best in class. Yeah, Actually, because there are some features. There that is, are, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's when... To be a clear-cut best in class yeah, yeah, is yeah. hard. Yeah, it's, it's hard. It's hard. It's hard. So usually there are certain features that are better than others, right? And and I think that's that's where the USP is very clear, right? You try to highlight the USP and also kind of define what kind of audience or what what depending on who, what their goals are, you know, it, it works best for them, right? It serves their needs. And I think that's the fundamental of choosing any tool, right? Or even reading content. You must know like... 
like what do you really want like yeah. what, what is your incentive structure what are your goals because that then fundamentally affects you, you, your choices I just want to do a plug in here actually right so one of the, the the companies that I really like the way they do content marketing is Endowers I give you an example right so everybody know of trailer fees right now right which is the amount that the fund manager sometimes give back to the advisor who sells it right uh, but Endowers is the first company that built its business model around rebating that trailer fee. And then they did a lot of education around what it is. Mm. So in that sense, you know, the content marketing to me was done right. Because what they're doing is that they were educating a lot of Singapore investors, both young and old, about something that a lot of investors didn't know about. And then it also happens to serve what their purpose is and their mm. marketing message well. Mm. So I think those are where it's really well integrated, where you have... Your content marketing uh, focus is on something that it's very relatable to what your brand wants to do, mm, mm, right? Mm. And and um, and not sponsored. <laughs> not sponsored. I mean, they, they sometimes do sponsor. Yeah, or sometimes yeah, yeah, they write yeah. it on their own. Sometimes even. they do. Sometimes they yeah, do. So but, I think yeah. those are really just I, again not trying to say the product is great. Or what. I'm just saying that the messaging that they do yeah, it, yeah, it yeah, is yeah. very in tune to what their brand wants to advocate. Mm, mm, mm. Right. Fair, fair. So then, in in your whole ten years of writing and all that, right? Like. Your your goals definitely also develop over time. Right? As an individual. Yeah, as an individual, okay. your goals okay. develop over time. So um, what, what are some of these things that you put out, some of these content that you put out that age very well as your goals kind right. of develop? I think the whole idea, and more so than ever, right? I, I realized that financial decisions, when we make them early in, their, in our life, can really give us a lot of value in the long term. So stuff that age very well, on, for me personally, emergency savings. Right. So when, when I was younger and, and this was before I was married, before we have kids. Everything invests. Uh no, no, no. We we, <laughs> okay. we, we make it a point to okay. save save. Uh, you have to be a, a, a diligent saver when you're young. Great. So misconception number one, right? When my salary becomes higher, I can save more mm -hmm. compared to when I start working, my salary not so high. So how much can I save? Misconception. Why? Because you will hit stage stages in life where you can no longer save even if you want to. For example, you got your kids, you got your house, you got your parents who need your support. And then at that point in time, sure, your salary may have risen double from the first day you started working. But your costs, your essential costs may go up triple four times, mm -hmm. right? And you can't afford not to spend, right? For example, healthcare, do you want to not afford to spend? You know, very hard for us to budget this kind of thing. Each time you need to go hospital, A&E, $150, you know, which parent would, if they can afford it, say, no, no, I'm going to not go mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. Hard, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and these things multiply as you have multiple kids as well. <laughs> so um, I have three kids, huh, really. So yeah. start saving early. I think that's very important. Start, uh, when I started saving early, it also helped me when I actually wanted to do dollars and cents full-time because I had a little bit more financial security knowing that, you know, even if we can't make money for the first year, I can, I'm still okay mm. because I have my emergency savings to fall back on, mm. right? Thankfully, I didn't have to tap on it too much because uh, we were able to generate revenue um, once we went full-time because we already started on a sideline for a few years already. So emergency saving is something really very important. Start, starting your investment journey earlier, um, I think those are, are, are super vital topics um what else have each well diversified portfolio which i think everyone says um no but back then it wasn't yeah. hit back then it was very indie yes right and then now it's like mainstream so yeah i think you can't blame the ass of last time or the people no, no, in the no, past no, no, but because age well right? yeah because that, in the past sense, it's yes. very hard in the past it's very hard to get a diversified portfolio mm -hmm. you don't have your robo advisors your etfs are limited in singapore right so those days are quite hard but it is really true right another one which which has gone under the radar until recently fixed income, mm -hmm. right? So in the last five years, everybody equity, equity, equity. You see what happened this mm -hmm. year, right? You know, everyone with high risk, you know, and then the whole risk tolerance, don't invest too much if you're not willing to take on that risk. You know, this year you really see that difference already. So um, in some sense, I'm glad that some of this HO um, advice has, has panned out well, but unfortunately it has to come at the cost of like a market downturn la, for people to really see. Then now you see the opposite effect, everybody charging for the bonds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. SSB, treasury bills, mm. everyone all demanding it, right? So you can see how investors think also, right? When everyone wants to invest in stocks, everyone chong for stocks, the price <laughs> goes up, people chong some more. Then now, because of the recession, because of interest rate hike, naturally, people are more interested in bonds because bonds got high interest rate. But then when it's chong, it's everyone all chong into their one, mm. right? So this kind of things, no financial advice here, but sometimes, you know, you have to observe how people think about the investment uh, space la. 
sometimes I wish people are able to think of their investment journey independently of what other people are doing. Tell me, tell me. Because on some level, as content houses, we are pushing certain ideas. I mean, know? we write, we write yeah, what we, write, we, write we, write what we what think people are interested yeah, in, yeah. right? And, and, okay, so Which that, is a very logical there, thing there, that you should there's, do. There's that, there's that part. Yeah. You know, but also there are certain parts like you've established that, you know, uh, you guys, at this point in time, the whole editorial team is very into the property space. So you write generally a little bit more, right? So then as a big publishing or at least a relatively big mm-hmm. publishing house, then you perfume the space with a certain angle right um, and even on our end we also talk you know about um, some ideas that we are like more more into so we also talk about some of these things or the trends that are yeah, quite yeah, interesting yeah. so, right? so, so there, are, there are some of these ideas right so what, what do you mean by like you hope that people could do it independently because it's, it's, a, it's, it's very hard. So that's the thing, right? If, yeah. are, if let's say we are, I mean, we are all in the media space, right? So people read, people consume the content that they're interested in that, that is what people write about, right? But here's the thing, right? It's, it's like, think of it as, let's use an example of the food industry, right? Good food, quality food in Singapore is all around us, right? But then when you see Sometimes a food block suddenly cover this, you know, very good nasi padang somewhere. Usually the, the third day, one. Usually the third one. Then the next day, there will be a huge queue and uh, the queue might e- easily last for one week, two weeks, sometimes one month, mm, right? Mm. Until the next trend comes, mm. right? And so what happens is that if you are following the food site, you are just basically queuing up all the time. Because mm, mm. everywhere you want to go, it goes viral, you read, then yeah. you queue up. And then maybe when you queue up, the food quality suffer. Yes, <laughs> yes. The guy is selling in volumes. Your experience dwindle, right? Yes, yes. And for you to actually get the best experience yourself, what you need to do is if you really like to eat, you know, you go and find yourself, mm. right? Don't just rely on what the food blog yeah, says, yeah, yeah. right? I, I mean, that's a quite common I mean. sense I, thing. I you, you, can, you can rely, no, no. use it to get information, yeah, but yeah. don't always rely. I know, I know. Right? And it's the same thing with investing, right? Yeah. You can, you can read the the media space, you can read what we are writing, what you are discussing about, what other sites are writing or even the video content, right? But as an investor, if you want to be successful in the long term or want to have a higher chance of being successful, you also have to do some independent form yeah, of research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, I did a piece around this idea of like why ETFs that follow hype fails, right? Or like why hype ETFs fail or why, why certain theme, new theme funds tend to fail because they are formed out of a hype because a lot of people are interested in this thing. I, I think in the recent decade, it was like green tech la, or like EVs la, or like uh, cannabis. La, you know, some of these big trends, you know, that, that developed into ETFs right? because there was so much trends, the underlying stocks were flying up and then all these fund houses decided, like, oh, wait, a lot of people want this thing. Let us create a fund. <laughs> and then they launch as ETF and when the ETF is launched, they're buying all these underlying stocks, you know, peak prices and then you come in because you follow the hype, you buy up the ETFs and then eventually, I think, you know, yeah, but I just the cycle kind of comes I, I down. I was just saying here, which is that mm. it may not be that the trend is wrong per se, no, it, but, but it, yeah. what is likely mm. is that you are paying a higher price. Yes. So, so the money is going into the exactly. space. Exactly. So it's not that the trend is You may is still off. be right. You yeah. may still be right. Yeah, but 50 years later. You no, know, but you're likely you paying a higher price. price. Yes. The problem comes when, uh, and this is what is a better litmus test of what is a good company, is when the hype is gone. Mm-hmm. Yeah, how are yeah. they performing yeah yeah yes. so so my observation over the decade or maybe eight years or eight years of investing is that there will be a hype and then all these etfs or whatever will form and then uh, a lot of people enter after that the thing will come down it may not crash but it will cool off and then right? you see the downturn yes. who so, is still that, surviving yes so and that downturn but a lot of people you know will fall off during that downturn and then after that that is when the space become interesting to look at it you know not in the early days if you write if you write that because I'm following the narrative of you say like oh there's a blog that they publish and then everybody got a queue at Makan right you're gonna be stuck at the queue all the time I mean, right? the, so, I mean so, so back to mm-hmm. the food energy the, the food might still be good though yes <laughs> yes. so it's not that the food is not good but yeah. you're always stuck on the queue right correct, and sometimes correct. it will sell out blah blah blah, blah. but I think so, you see, yeah but this is the, uh, if you mm. talk about food again a nice mm. nice distraction there right mm. but like you know sometimes people do purposely just queue up at where the longest queue is mm. because mm. the perception is that if the queue is long, it must be good. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah, fair, so to some extent, there's some element of truth in there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> on, on some level. But I think when it comes to investing, you know, uh, the, the hype is quite a problem, you know, for yeah. a lot of investors. Like. You know, that's a funny story, right? Yeah. Sometimes, you know, you've seen that same shop in near your neighborhood uh, for many years. You never really try. Then one day, some food block cover it and then you see uh, 30 people in the queue. 
then suddenly you have a tendency, hey, maybe I should check it out too, right? Mm. Even though that's, that that place was always there for the last 10 years. I guess that's what I mean. Like, yeah, like you, yeah. you, if, but if you do your own research, then you will know. Yeah. yeah. yeah but yeah. that said, you know, the stock market is also sometimes somewhat a popularity contest in the short term, it especially. Is, so you might buy a good company contest. that you think that is good. Mm. And then the next five years, Price it's gonna never be a moved. shit show. Yes, yeah. it is. It's, it's horrible. And everything else you see going again, yeah, going up. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so uh, my rule of thumb is generally I avoid the hype, lah. Right. When the hype dies down, then I will come and like look at it. And say, hey, what, what's actually going on here? <laughs> right. Why was there a hype? Is there something on? You know, is it still yeah, worth yeah. it? Is it still worth it? Is there something to look at? So I'm the bargain hunter, lah. Right. It's, uh, you know, like. <laughs> So, it's true, like, it's true. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so and, and and that's just for everybody. You have your own investing style. Uh, but yeah, just to plug an episode, you can go and check out uh, one of the earlier episodes that I did. Right? Why hype ETS fail? <laughs> yeah, cool. Um, in closing, is there any other things you want to add for you know reading, consuming content, and being a little bit like more rigorous in trying to discern information in this huge world of information? Yeah, I think when it comes to finance, like you know, it's, it's quite important for us to take it quite seriously because mm. small financial decisions, small financial habits you do when you're young can it result does, in a huge does. return yeah, in it, the it, long it, term. It, everything compounds, everything not just compounds. money. Yes. Mm. Money, knowledge also compounds. Yes, yes. The more habits, you know, everything. the easier it is for you to understand the financial world better and to be able to differentiate between what is maybe valuable and what's just noise. I think Right now in the financial media space, the digital space, right? A lot of people are more fixated towards short form content. Our know? audience, okay, la, they all listen 30, listen 40, 50 one minutes. Hour, so, yeah, one good. hour, it's yeah. very long already. Yeah, too yes, long. Yes. Hey, hey, wait, wait. <laughs> don't even for us, don't you know. Say, yeah, right? Even for us sometimes. Just nice, uh, just nice. Yeah. Please stay around. It must yes. be, uh, <laughs> I always say in Singapore, must finish within 25 the, minutes, the 30 minutes, to yes. get to work, mm, you know, mm, from start to end, 30 that's minutes. That's optimal time. Yeah, yes, yes, okay. yes. That's why I tell all the advertisers. One, one, uh, one journey, one train journey. Yes, it is true. It is true. All right. So long form content is still important and articles is one way. I don't even think it's long form. I think about books. No, I think articles are very short. These yeah, days. short, yeah. yeah. But, but it's long for a lot of people these days already lah. Oh, really? yeah, they don't, okay, they don't okay. really want to read a 1,500 okay. words article. Okay, fair, Unfortunately, fair. books, a lot of us, right, we mm-hmm. get our early days knowledge from books. You see the... What's the book you recommend? I read one up on Wall Street. One up on Wall okay, Street. I won't say okay. I recommend, but these are the ones that open your eyes up. Mm-hmm. Read Freakonomics. Freakonomics is great. Freakonomics, right? It's okay. fun. You know, it tells you about how the world works. Uh, one up on Wall Street. So start by reading. Like, mm-hmm. I think reading is very important. Articles are great, but books are even better. Pick old books. You don't need to follow the advice. You don't need yeah, to follow yeah. or memorize it unless you are a true believer. Yeah, but it yeah. opens up your eyes on how people think about the financial does, markets, how the financial market operate. What are ways that it could be manipulated? You know, in some sense, yeah. when everyone like what you say, everyone chong for yeah, the ETF, high, the chong, price chong, goes chong. up. Yes, yes, yes. Right, opens up your even if you the strategies you don't really remember mm-hmm, or believe mm-hmm, in. Right, so all these things are very important. You need to discern because I think there's a lot of noise in the market you need to discern between sites that are so how do you discern some ways are quite easy you look at the 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 purpose of certain sites right yeah, or content marketing yeah, sites about. right some sites you are just i mean I'm just gonna say i mean there are product comparison sites they sometimes just write what they want is kind of for you to mm. choose a products with mm-hmm. them and stuff like that so uh, always know the purpose and the motive of a content site that you're reading. I think it's very important, including dollars and cents, including yourself as well, right? What is our purpose? Mm. You know, why are we doing this work, right? We are advertising driven, Mm. right? So you come to our site, you will see ads on the site, you will see some sponsored posts. Mm. You don't have to buy the products or anything, you know, it's just there. If you agree with the content, you want to check out more on your own, you should go. So never make a purchase decision just based on one article, you know, and you go to another, you know, comparison site, you know, you you should know what their purpose is, lah. You go to a product platform player, they have articles, you should know what their purpose in, mm-hmm. right? And, and I think that's very important. I think it's quite common sense, mm-hmm. wouldn't you say? But, but sometimes I don't know, many the- things. I think common sense, my team tell me not very common one. So I I, yeah. I feel like we should ask, we should ask yourself it what's there. the purpose of yes. sites. La, yes, right? Yes, ask yes, yourself, yes. you know, if it's a individual blog, the type of profile they are, the person is in, right? Is mm. the person same age as you, older, younger, all these things matter, right? Yeah, yeah, because yeah, you can't yeah. just take their advice and implement on your own yes, if they yes. have a different risk profile or different view than you are. Mm, yeah. mm, mm. So understanding the context, I think is still the basis yeah. of a lot of these things. Like. Great, great, cool stuff. Um, maybe one last thing for the aspiring writers out there that want to write and one day, you know, compete with you. All right. 
<laughs> compete. Uh. I yeah, must yeah, discourage com- them, man. <laughs> Just like <laughs> how I discourage you, don't be a podcaster. Yeah, yeah. How, right? much don't join, don't how much join. can you make? Right? Don't, don't, yeah, don't join, okay? Go do I, something I else. Yeah, you, yeah, yeah, how much yeah, can you make yeah, in yeah, Singapore? Yeah. Small space. Small space, small mm-hmm. space. Even yes, you yes. are the best also, you can't make much money. Yeah, yeah, Those yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah. jokes aside, I think um, we started writing because we were passionate about the topic. I think it's very, very important to be passionate in the topic that you're writing about. What I'm seeing these days is that financial influencers are starting to become a bit lucrative, right? It is. Right. Mm. Maybe not in Singapore yet, but Mm. definitely overseas. So I definitely can see a trend because what happens in the US, sometimes it just takes a matter of time before it comes into Singapore. Sometimes I usually, it will will almost come. You can (laughs) foresee one. Yes, yes. Right. So if you look at the US, um, the TikTokers, the personalities, the KOLs there, right? Mm. Uh, A lot of them are gearing into financial trading, such topics. And, uh, the idea is that because they know that the financial advertisers can pay money. CPM so is the highest. Yes. CPM is the highest. And that's why people are producing content. But my thought uh, that you, sh- in, in Singapore at least, you should really do what you are interested in mm. because our market is small. So what works in the US, even if it comes to Singapore, mm. you know, and you are very popular, it doesn't mean you will make a lot of money just mm. doing, mm. you know, mm. uh, something that you don't really like. Yeah. Right. So just do what you're passionate in. If, if it's writing, go ahead. It's not easy. La. I think Reggie can testify. <laughs> from my advertising <laughs> but it's like you want it, the, the cost of running a site like ours is quite high yeah, I mean yeah, I'm not yeah. sure if people realize it but we, we probably run on an at least our editorial cost probably run at, a, at an operating cost that's definitely way higher than any bloggers or even some of the smaller media outlets I'll say right so it's very hard to hire in this space it's very hard to hire very it's not hard cheap to hire, to hire yes, yes. Um, writers right so the operating cost is very very high and our advertising business model is not easy as well because mm. readers are very unlikely to pay you unless you run a model where you are kind of like giving a lot of insights and recommendations yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, those are people, very popular very yeah, because popular. people will pay if they mm-hmm. feel like paying you will make them more money yeah, yeah. but sites like ours you you can't really, I mean, there's no recommendation, right? Mm, mm, it's just all the typical things you should be doing. Mm. You know, people won't pay for that kind of content. Yeah, yeah. So you got to be, we got to be careful, lah, right? Yeah, and then yeah. you have to deal with the advertisers as well. Yeah. They have all the, one, uh, it's a totally uh, set of problems. Different, different set of problems. All together, right? I don't hate you guys, uh, by the way, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> I just hope to educate you. <laughs> so so hopefully this is enough to discourage competitors <laughs> from our space. Yeah, yeah. Or you can learn from the, the, the Instagram you know, following the, the passion thing make me remind me of this Instagram page called the Pandan Pig or something like that. What does uh, it do? This guy is amazing. He just goes to all these his IG page, I think Pandan Waffle Pig or Pandan Pig or whatever. This guy just goes to every single Pandan Waffle in Singapore, right? And then he has a very structured, you know, texture, oh, taste, wow. color. That's passion, uh. Everything. Then got like one, two, three star, and there's a very serious rating pandan system. Waffle, yeah, yeah, Pandan oh, Waffle wow. Pig. Let me go and find something. Oh, if, if you guys know, please drop it in the comment passion, section. True passion Damn there. passion. Hey, he got like what? 8,000, 9,000 oh, followers. Goodness. A lot of passionate Pandan Waffle people, right? I was like, wow, this guy is amazing. Oh, right? that's so, crazy. You know, but, but uh, if you are if you are that guy, I mean, I DM you to ask you to come on the show. Maybe you can actually come on the show, right? So, so I want to know how you're going to make money out of this, right? Genuine so, passion. Damn it. Genuine passion. And let's be clear, <laughs> even if this doesn't become like like your side hustle of writing or blogging or creating content doesn't become your main thing it could be a thing that you know adds up in your life and right? it's a valuable yeah. skill because yeah. a it lot is, of people are looking for writers to join financial writers to join their marketing comms team it nowadays is, yeah. Yeah, yeah so maybe you don't want to compete with Tim, like you can join him. Eh? <laughs> so, enjoy oh, recruitment, uh, please drop here. Yes. Yeah. Email to Timothy at Dawson Sense. It's, it's definitely it's definitely easier to join than to compete. It does. I would say does, if yes, you are yes. passionate in writing, join mm. a team that shares in your passion. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we are endlessly recruiting. Hello at the financial coconut.com. I will see you on the other side. Yeah. Okay. Join join a team that's passionate rather yes, than yes, compete yes, against yes, them. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Thank you. Love it. Love it. Okay, Tim. Uh, we have uh TFC's three money questions. Right. The first question is what has been your best and worst investment you've ever made? Okay, I'll give you one financial, one non-financial, right? <laughs> okay, great. So best the, and worst. The, uh? the financial so far is um I was very, very fortunate. I bought my BTO flat early. I, mean, I was one of those... You sure you don't get cancelled? Right? <laughs> no, I mean, that was like 2011. Okay, okay, I mean, okay, that's, okay, that's okay. more than 10 years yes, ago. Yes, 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 right? yes. So I was very, very fortunate to, mm. to buy my BTO uh, flat early um, because it was, you know, and, and just happened to also marry the same person later on, mm. uh, thankfully. So because BTO flats are, are really a lot more affordable, yeah, like, especially yeah. when you're young. So that that is, I think, one of the best financial decisions, just purely from a monetary point of view. Mm. The non-financial one, and, and it sounds cliche, but 
but it's really very important. I think I married, my, my wife and I share very similar attitudes towards money. Mm. I think that's the number one thing that, I mean, that's one of the most important thing that helps with our finance plans, right? That we have the same attitude towards saving, we have the same attitude towards planning for the future. Obviously, when it comes from an investment point of view, I have a lot more opinions <laughs> what to invest in. But in general, we have the same attitude about towards money mm. and uh, that helps both in terms of your financial plans um, as a family, as well as, you know, in the, in marriage as well. Because, you know, I think financial disagreement can can really cause a lot of stress, mm, you know, mm. in, in a marriage. Like so, what's the worst? Worst investment? I wouldn't say it's the worst thing because I thankfully haven't made a lot of mistakes in my investment journey. But I think I wish I started investing in overseas market when I was young, mm, 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 right? Because yeah. um, not, not an excuse. Because but, there was a huge rally from 2011. No, like, to... I think not an excuse, but really like back in 2012, I think it's not so easy to invest overseas mm. at that point. Lesser ETFs available, definitely no robo portfolios to consider, right? And the truth is that I probably invested too much in the Singapore market when I was young, which I still hold some of these positions because, you know, the long-term some of these, these companies are still fine, which ironically in 2022, so far- They are performing They are everyone. all performing, yes. right? Mm -hmm. So I guess that geographical diversification mm -hmm. point of view does mm -hmm. hold weight, right? Because Singapore companies, especially the blue chips, have been quite resilient thus far. But yeah, I do wish I, I invested in overseas market much more earlier. But back then, you know, I just didn't really put in enough effort to go search for alternatives. Yeah. Back then, the effort was a lot it's higher. A lot, and yes. more expensive. Yes, yes. A lot more expensive. Yes, yes. Now it's much easier. Now it's yeah, really so it becomes easy. the talk of the yeah, town. Everyone correct. is doing it. Yeah. Okay, next question. Uh, what is one thing under $100 that has become a game changer? It's a, a bit of a cheating answer, but uh. for me, it's more like um, I, I started subscribing to sports a lot more. So it's, it's under mm -hmm. $100 a month. Nah. Mm -hmm. okay. <laughs> no, not like... <laughs> Not perpetual. <laughs> a month. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, okay. so what happened was like uh, during the pandemic, actually it started during the pandemic, right? So mm. during the pandemic was mental, I mean, you're all cabin fever, you do work. Horrible, yes. How many yes. hours can you work at home, yes, you know, yes, writing yes. Oh articles, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even, even you need to rest, right? You know, when the, when the borders open, immediately I go. You rest, right? <laughs> I, can, I cannot tahan, it's like cabin fever. Yeah, so, yes. so I actually started subscribing to a lot of spots mm. um, at that point in time. Which which actually helped me uh decompress a lot better la, You mean like joint programs? No no or... sports like so like the UFC ah, NBA oh, NBA okay 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 um so like watch the show watch the okay, sports okay, and, okay, okay. and some I thought of, you like you know no <laughs> like, time, never you can't even go to the gym fair, you know fair, that's fair, the problem fair, 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 fair. right okay. so I think for everyone is different but yeah. I think we need to decompress and sometimes we just need something that's totally unrelated to our work <laughs> and just enjoy it. And, <laughs> yeah. and for me, it's like, okay, okay, I used to tell my, my wife, you know, you know, I, you know, my way of decompressing, not too bad, you know, go to the gym, mm. uh, run, carry some weights, not, not so bad, it's free, it's healthy, right? So during the pandemic, you can't do that, right? Mm. So then sports, I subscribe. Mm -hmm. And I think that that has been game changer for me. La, for great, me. great, great, great. I don't great. know if anyone can relate to that. No, you know why I'm laughing now? <laughs> yeah. you know, because the, the thing that I watch to like kind of tune out, right, is people cleaning the hoofs, you know, <laughs> You know, oh, have wow. you seen those videos I, where the, I, the guy like clean the hooves? I don't think I mean those things, clean, but clean the hooves of the, on your, the horses, on the your, donkeys, the cows. I was like, wow, very cool, huh? very clean. Definitely on thing. your content, I'll go lah. <laughs> Some someday this thing appeared on my recommend. I clicked in and never stopped coming. Yeah. You know, but but okay. I, I when when I'm not feeling it, then I will turn it off. Yeah, right. Okay. Last question. One place you learn from that you think is underrated. The one that I recently read that I really like is this book called Dollars and Cents. It tells you about the way people think about money, mm. and I I just bought it because I was like, hey, this similar name to the website. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I we can just put up. it in this thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's really good. You know. Nice, nice. And they, and you have a column on the site that interviews all these people? Oh yeah, we have okay. a column on our business doors and business site that mm. interviews entrepreneurs. So we ask them uh, questions. Lah. And sometimes the questions are very random. Like, mm. what's your daily routine? And then what are some of your favorite books that have inspired you? And yeah, that the, the books that so far I've seen the answers being given. Sometimes I make it a point to buy some of the books and, and they have been truly quite as exceptional, really changed the way you think. Or at least, you know, opens up your mind to stuff that, you know, you never really think about both in terms of personal life as well as business well nice right. nice nice check them Go out check it. them yeah. out thank you thanks for your time all right thanks reggie love it bye take care bro Woo.